Hi, this is Robert Clinky Beard with the Commercial Landscaper Podcast. We're going to take 20 minutes to deliver some amazing content from accomplished leaders and business owners to provide you with some value to scale your business and to become a better leader and push yourself out of your comfort zone. We encourage you to like and share with everyone to spread our messages. I'm super excited to announce our new partnership with Weathermatic. For most landscape companies, irrigation is an untapped gold mine for growth and profit, but labor and process problems stand in the way. So Weathermatic has created a partnership to package mobile technology and software with proven business solutions to tackle the perennial irrigation challenges and take your operations to a whole new level. I encourage you to reach out to Weathermatic and learn more. Cheers, everyone. Hi, this is Robert Clicky here with the Commercial Landscaper Podcast. I'm really excited to be joined again by John Muni. John, welcome. Hi, Robert. Thanks for having me. So, John, uh, you've, uh, t- t- I, you know, there's obviously we have a ton of listeners, subscribers, but I'm, I'm sure there's a few people that have not heard about your background. So, maybe if you don't mind, just give us another quick uh, background on and who you are, how you came into the industry. Yeah, started in 19, uh, December 18th, 1997, incorporated. Um, so, 1998 was our first year. I- uh, yeah, that, that's kind of a long story too. Uh, how <laughs> how uh, now Cardinal Gregory of the Washington D.C.'s Archdiocese kind of talked me into going into business, but that that can be a story for another day. Um, and yeah, so starting nineteen, you know, ninety eight was our first full year, um, and you know, strictly was full service residential. You know, mowing, lawn care, tree and shrub care, pruning, mulch, pool maintenance, spa maintenance, irrigation, flowers. Just happened to grow up in both industries. Um, so I felt like there was an opportunity for us to provide a turnkey service for affluent residential customers. And that led to us um, doing work for um, the president of the Cardinals in 2000. And he, he, really appreciate what we did and had no business giving us uh, an introduction to his operations guy at Bush Stadium. Because in my mind, like looking back, I'm like, holy cow, like if 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 a large company would make you fill out a qualification, like bid qualification sheet, like I'm not sure what box we would have checked <laughs> that would have said, yeah, hire these guys, right? But, you know, Mark was just one of those dynamic leaders that just saw things in people, right? And, um, you know, made the introduction. We had to sell it. Like Mark didn't give it to us. We had to sell it. And 2005, we we did the landscape maintenance down at Bush Stadium. And they've been a customer ever since. So, I mean, we're almost, gosh, what's that, 18 years? Holy cow. Wow, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then, so let's see, that was 05. And then, yeah, I mean, we just we just started picking up commercial accounts. You know, 2010, we pick up the two leading malls in the area. Um, you know, I think 11 or 12, Edward Jones Corporate Campus, Principia College. You know, I mean, we just enterprise rent a car, Washington University, Mercy Hospital. Then 2018, Mercy asked us to go down to Springfield, Missouri. And, you know, that led us to us getting those hospitals, all their clinics. Then that led to Big Cedar Lodge in Branson. Um, you know, just, yeah, I was just being asked this the other day, like, what do you attribute your growth to? And, and this sounds so boring, but when you gladly make and keep commitments, you know, you, you keep your customers. You know, our retention rate varies between like 96 and 99% per year. And when you keep customers like that, you can't help but grow. You know what I mean? Like, and, and you know, obviously the referrals they spin off and everything. So I mean, take take the recent acquisitions out of the conversation. You know, our organic growth is is consistently well into double digits. And I think that you know, in baseball, they they call it locating your fastball, right? If you locate your fastball. All your other pitches work and our fastball is delighting our customers doing doing what we say we're going to do and and if we do if we if we don't follow through we don't do it right you know we're not perfect 
we run to the problem. We we and we fix it as fast as we can at at no, you know, no pain to our customer. It's our fault. So right. I think when your clients know that you ache for their success and you always operate in their best interests and you put their needs ahead of your own, your needs get taken care of. Yeah. 100%. So anyway, that, that's a quick and dirty background to, to how we start and where where we're at. No, I love that. You know, it's interesting because I did a podcast with um, Frank Mariani and last week and uh, you know, he talked about the importance of relationships and that's you know, what he attributes his growth to. But you, you you make a great point. It's great to have relationships, but you've got to perform. You've got to yeah. follow through and what your commitment is. Well, I mean, think about it. Any relationship of value is built, is built on trust, right? If you don't have trust, you don't have a relationship. And yeah. in the service world, you know, how you build trust is by execution, mm -hmm. right? Do, can, do you consistently do what you say you're going to do? And, and when you not only do what's in the scope of the contract, and they don't have to worry about that, but you look for things beyond the scope of the contract to bring to their attention, to enhance their brand. You know, we, we, we talk to our people all the time. Look for things outside of landscaping even. If you can help save them a trip to to the mall or whatever, because the you know storm came through and the back fence blew down or whatever, right? Like we don't do fencing, but what a great thing it is to pull out your phone and take a picture, send oh, yeah. it to the property manager and say, Hey, I care about you on a personal level. You need to be aware of this. We don't do fencing, but you know, take a look at this. Or if you need the names of fencing companies in the area, we can do that for you. Like yeah. just care about people on a personal level and the game changes. No, I agree. We, we would do the same thing, you know, graffiti, damage fences, walls, just yeah, that extra sets of eyes and ears for your client. Uh, that was right. huge. That's right. So share what you can, John, you know, the end of 2022, what, what you know, size of your company, uh, how, how, just to give our audience a, a scale of size of your company. Yeah, we hit 25 million in 2022. Okay. Um, yeah, it was kind of interesting. Like 2019, we were 17.5, and we've only we only reduced in size twice in our history. 2009, we were weighted too heavy in construction, and when the recession hit, that really really hurt us. We went from two and a half million in 2008 to two million in revenue in 2009. Not that I remember. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, 2019, we were 17.5. And 2020, we dropped down to 15.5, in part because it was a light snow year. Uh, but we also noticed, you know, people got a little fearful. So we saw our enhancements drop. Right. Um, you know, some of the commercial install projects got, got put on hold because of supply chain issues and things like that. But then we we went from fifteen five to twenty one, and then twenty one big, big jump, twenty one to twenty five. But here's the cool thing: in twenty twenty, when when we saw sales slowing down, we never took our foot off the gas. We stayed like committed. We stayed committed to the sales plan mm. because I just I just believed that it was not a long term problem. And you know, just not not that I was particularly wise, just perhaps you know, just dumb luck. Um, but yeah, I, we we took we never took our foot off the gas, and I think I think that really helped us. I mean, right now we have more we have more opportunities than I mean, our sales team here in St. Louis and even in Oklahoma City, we are struggling to keep up with interest from prospects, which is, I mean, it's, it's super exciting. Um, it's also, it's also kind of humbling. Like when you set out to have a vision to say, gosh, I think if we do business a certain way, it could really resonate with people and, yeah. you know, serve with humility and just, again, like ache for their success. And when you make that your priority, 
it, I, I just think that it's a difference maker. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. So yeah, twenty five million at the end of twenty twenty two. Cool, nice job. So you know, twenty five million. I know your team. You've got a great leadership team in place. You know, you could have just sat back, enjoyed your team running the company. You could have enjoyed just you know taking a nice you know. <laughs> chunk of money for the business getting a good decided. golf game <laughs> <laughs> doing your golf uh, went to big big cedar yeah. um, but uh, you know you decide to go a different direction what what was the, the the catalyst that made you change your mind or, or, or maybe adjust your mindset well so oh man I gotta think what it was Maybe 20, 2019. Oh no, it was it was uh it was right at the start of the pandemic. Um the the California's doing mask mandates and in this in the Midwest, it had not gotten here yet. And uh Kevin Kehoe and I were out to dinner in in Chesterfield, a suburb of St. Louis. And we had a really nice dinner and a really nice exchange. And I had the opportunity to just kind of share with them that, you know, he kind of changed my arc in a couple of ways. Uh, one, as a business consultant, I brought in uh, February of 2011. And prior to that, I really didn't know how to run a business, honestly. I mean, I just, I, we, we were good at the work. We were good at keeping commitments. But how that made sense on a budget and how you you know, got your return on assets and like just, just the stuff you need to know to run a business. I did not know. And Kevin taught me that like, and the next year we made 10% net just by, by him saying, focus here, focus here, do this, change that. Like just some real basic, get your org chart set up. Like, you know, I had like 14 direct reports that he, yeah. He made it's me turn in like it's all the lot. stuff. He, and, and he said, he said, org chart, like you had, I had to turn all stuff into him and I'll try and make this quick. But he said, nothing fancy. Like don't go on Excel, just on a piece of paper, draw out your org chart. So I did. And so then he gives me feedback before he comes into town and he gets to org chart, you know, number four, whatever it is, org chart dash John comma. This is not an org chart period. This is a drawing of the solar system. One of your kids did. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so that's kind of and like once I saw him, like, oh my god, I could really work with this guy. So uh, it was so true, though. Like, John, you need to boil it down. You know, here are your direct reports. And anyway, so he taught me. He taught me that. And then you know, I was also involved at the ground floor with Aspire and. And that was, you know, just a, a tremendous experience and an opportunity. And so we just had a really touching, like, it was just a great evening. And, uh, and, and he said to me during that dinner, after I shared with him the impact that he made, he said, John, I think you're a top five CEO in the industry. And he said, the best part is you have no idea. And I still don't think he's fully right. Like there are, there are so many guys you look up to, right? Um, but that really caught my attention. You know, here's a guy that's been around the country and he's seen some good operators. And 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 for him, you know, Kevin, as you well know, he wasn't one to throw around things he didn't mean, right? Yeah. And, um, and you know, we we're working with Bruce through the peer groups, Bruce Wilson and had Bruce doing some consulting for us and he was in St. Louis and he and I were having dinner and I shared that story with him. And, you know, Bruce, he swirled his martini, <laughs> kind of looked over his glasses, cleared his throat. And he said, I don't disagree with Kevin. And I would be interested potentially in being part of something, but, and I, maybe I failed to mention it. Kevin said he'd like to be part of, of uh, scaling up focal point if I ever wanted to do that. Like right, he'd, he'd right. like to help with that. And Bruce agreed, you know, again, he said, I, I don't disagree with Kevin and, and I would be interested too. Okay, John, you have you have two 
industry guys that you've looked up to for a long time and for them to believe in you like that and, and see something in you that is not readily visible to me. Um, that's a big deal. Right. And it's kind of like, it's a flexion moment where, where you say, well, are they right? Or am I too fearful to find out? And, and, you know, that, that's when you kind of say, am I ready for the next challenge? So I, I didn't have, I wasn't equipped to do that in my mind. Like I didn't know what it would take to grow a business past where I was at. And I knew I was going to have to put people together in a, you know, Kevin obviously was sick. Um, and I love like, God, that guy had the best spirit ever. I mean, like, even even through eight years of being sick, he just kept the freaking hammer down. Like, oh, yeah. and the fact oh, that yeah. he wanted to be part of this, like, there I, we could just do a podcast on him alone. But um, anyway, so you know, Kevin or Bruce obviously you know is involved with with the consulting business and the peer groups and everything. So it wasn't like he was like, "Hey, I'm going to join your team full time and let's do this." So I put an advisory board together. Um. It, Bruce obviously is part of it. And then uh, we had Vern Harnish speak at one of our universities at Next Level University. And I found out that his daughter was going to Webster. And I okay. asked him if he was interested <laughs> in being on a, on our board. And he said, I'm not taking any more board positions. So I said, okay, I have a better question for you. I said, would you like to get paid to visit your daughter at Webster University? <laughs> I love that. And he, <laughs> and he goes, holy cow, that is a great sales pitch. <laughs> he said, you got a deal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, yeah. what a person to join your board as well well right i mean like the guy that wrote you know he he's uh yeah i mean wrote the book scaling up and you know he's the founder of of all systems related to you know I, I, if i'm not mistaken i think gene gino whitman kind of came from his branch and traction all that so anyway yeah it's tremendous to have burn on the board and and then um then Tim Spielman, who's a managing partner, private equity firm, and then uh, Chris Jagel, private investor, you know, forever been involved in successful businesses. And then we also utilize Jeff Hartness from Three Point Group uh, and Gloria with his team. I mean, they're they're just phenomenal as well. Um, so, you know, you you just know what you don't know, right? Like, I don't, you got to bring people in that that are smarter than you and can help guide you and you know, it, it became pretty clear that, you know, Vern made the comment. He said, John, he, you're in what I call the valley of death at 25 million. I'm like, okay. And he said, what I mean by that is you're at the size where you need some really great talent, but you're also at the size that you can't afford it. He said, you need to get to 40 million as fast as possible based on your goals and your vision for how good of a company you want. You're going to need you're going to need to build out your executive team and they should wow you and they should require no, none of your time to lead them. And, and what he meant by that was, you know, obviously strategically people need leadership, but, but that they are, they're very skilled and they're pushing you. And, um, and he said for you to be able to afford that level of talent, you're going to have to take it the next jump. And the best way to do that is through acquisitions. And, and if you can bring, through those acquisitions, you can bring strength to your executive team. That's that's the win-win, and you know that that's really what what happened with Brett Gordon and Signature in Oklahoma City. Um, you know, Brett and I were in a peer group together, and like my, my gosh, this guy's a good operator. You know, he was nine million dollars, ten million dollars at the time, and um, you know, he was just way ahead in his thinking on on things related to efficiency and, and just operations. And, you know, we were always kind of like market leader on, you know, on your customer set, you know, the customer satisfaction surveys that Pam does, we, we generally are a, among the top performers on that and employee engagement. You know, we've historically been very good at that and, you know, we're, we're a good operator, but we weren't operating at the crispness that, that Brett was operating at, you know, I mean, 
he had he had real life data coming in on a screen on the regular of how efficient his guys are running, and it would update every fifteen minutes. So he had like a leaderboard of his crew. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that. Holy cool. cow! Like, yeah, this yeah, guy's this guy's awesome. So anyway, the, there was an opportunity there, and and uh, you know, really, Kevin Kevin was the one that started the thinking, and and Bruce kind of reassured it. And that's what inspired us to, to look. And also, I mean, having conversations with, I do these anniversary dinners every month. And I would ask, I asked our employees, what are your dreams for yourself? And what are your dreams for the company? And that's such a fun conversation, but oftentimes the, the employees, they want to, they want to be part of a winning team. They want to be able to go home and say, man, yeah, look what we did. Look what we're doing. Yeah. And I'm part of an organization that still treats its employees like family. And oh, we're having to grow throughout the Midwest. Like they, they, they really wanted to see us grow. And when you, awesome. when you have, you know, people you look up to pulling you and the people that you lead pulling you, you know, it it you you, you can't let fear hold you back, right? No, I and, agree. And anyway, that's that's why that's, that's why awesome. we, that's why we took the jump. That's awesome. I mean, a couple of things I took away from that are, you know, surrounding yourself with the right people. You know, so if you hadn't had, you know, two, you know, inspirational leaders tell you what your potential were, I mean, you could still be sitting in, you know, doing 25, 26 million, but just to have that encouragement. And I think a lot of other business owners I come across that don't necessarily have that network or peer group or other inspiring leaders around them to help them push them out of the comfort zone. And, uh, you know, I think a, a lot of people do get stuck in that comfort zone. They just they just sit there or, or maybe they, they dream big, but they don't know the next steps yeah. to get there. And you, right. you made a key point there that, you know, again, surrounding yourself with a board of advisors who bring different expertise to help build that roadmap for your employees. Well, and when you have a few people on there that have done it before, you know, I'd like to tell you that I'm like the super courageous, like awesome business leader. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just not uh, the, the, the board answered my questions and gave me confidence, right? Like, you know, they basically said, if you do these five things, you're going to win. Oh, okay. Like that, that, that really helps take risk out of your decision, right? Because they're telling you where the potholes are at. You know, you're, you're taking this, you know, imagine driving a big car down the interstate really fast. And, you know, you've never done it before. So the, you don't know when the potholes are coming or how big they're going to be or whatever. And when you have people that are like, hey, this is it's coming here. You need to move in this lane over here or, or, or right. That's that really gives you confidence to be able to move forward with some some big decisions. And, yeah, it, it, it's that's the difference maker. And, and it, if not for the strength of that board and the confidence and support that they have provided and the guidance, none of this is, I mean, none of this is possible. And same goes for our team. I mean, you know, going from no acquisitions to three acquisitions in two months, like who does that? And we weren't well, counting who, who on, does that? <laughs> we weren't counting on three. The third one just kind of happened. And we were counting on the two to be at least three months apart. But, you know, you don't control the lawyers. You don't control the timing of the opportunities as well, you know, or especially the lawyers on the other side. And so it just kind of fell that way. And, you know, if not for the strength of our team that that's wired to look at challenges as opportunities and that they're wired to run to problems, like you want to talk about a cool thing to see, you know, seeing your people look into something like this and saying, all right, we'll figure it out. Like, whew, that is, that, that was a pretty, that's a pretty cool thing. But that, that wouldn't be achievable if you hadn't built a great culture. 
Because when you have a bad culture, people will will you know run away from those types of challenges. Yeah. Whereas if you've you've obviously taken care of people, built a great culture, so they're just looking to you know face up to it, step up their game. Yeah, Robert, I don't. Uh, perhaps the way I was raised, I don't give compliments well and I don't take them well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. Um, I, I, yeah. And I mean, we do, I, I would like to say that I'm the creator of a great culture and maybe, you know, to a degree that's true. You know, I mean, if, if you don't treat people with respect, they're not going to know how to treat other people with respect. And we have very high standards of what, what we expect of each other. Um, not only in terms of performance, but in terms of character of who we are as people. So I, I think there's truth to that, but it's just hard for me to hear that I created it. I just, you know, we just have wonderful people that, that adhere to their own high standards. And, you know, when you have a bunch of people that adhere to high standards together, just, you know, good things happen. Yeah. Well, well I can see it for you because I, I see yeah. it from the outside in. And, but, but the other thing I think it's important to see is, you know, you, you do a lot of the right things in terms of even just building your bench. You know, I was visiting a company a couple of days ago and, you know, they, they have great aspirations to grow the, you know, double, triple in size. And, you know, the conversation I had with them is, well, to get there, we need to build that bench and you do a great job of, you know, bringing in the interns and yeah. college students and all that. So I think that's a you know, testament to you looking ahead. Yeah, Robert, it's funny. I I think we're better than most. And I think we're operating at like oh, 60% of our potential as it relates to talent development. I, I I think as an industry, we are so bad at marketing what a great opportunity is to work here. You're not just at focal point, but in the industry as a whole. I mean, and th that's that's part of why I'm so adamant about how strict we are about dress code and professionalism, because it offends me that people view being a doctor, a lawyer, an attorney as a more desirable occupation than beautifying the world. Like it, it we have the luxury of our people getting to work outside and inspire the world not only by the outcome of their work, but the, but the manner by which they do it. And, and we don't articulate that message at all. I mean, it, and so, yeah, I mean, there's just so much more and, and that we're, we're excited to, that's become a real focus for us. You know, we're excited to see how we evolve in that space over the next you know, year to three years, because I think, I think we have an incredible story to tell, not only at focal point, but as an industry and we're doing a poor job at it. Um, no, the, this is a wonderful place for people to make a living um, and, and have great pride in the difference they're making in communities. And you cannot find that in just any job and we provide it in spades. No, I agree, hundred percent. You know, and, and you now acquiring three of the companies. I mean, your team must be excited. They must be excited about the opportunities that lie ahead for them. And and I, I don't think you're finished yet, growing. Hmm. So you know, they probably, you know, think to themselves, "Well, where could I position myself when your continued growth roadmap?" Well, you know what's kind of cool? Um, we're one of the few companies that are doing that are doing acquisitions that that's privately funded. You know, so I, I started the company and and I'm the source of funding. Um and and therefore, you know, like we have complete control of our culture and we have complete control of our priorities. And I think that that is super compelling to not only our employees, but also the people that, that we're partnering up with, because, you know, we don't, we don't have to meet specific profit covenants every month. Right now, obviously we have to make money, right? Like that's, that's a given, 
But if we choose to be strategic and we want to go into an investment to make our company better, to delight our customers more, to engage our employees more, and that's a that's a decision that the board and the leadership has decided like that's our priority. And it means we're going to take, you know, we're going to have to make an investment, then that's what we're going to do. We we want to build a great company. I, I you know, I had the opportunity to visit um, down in Chick-fil-A last fall. And, you know, there's so many things that they do that is different. Like they're not paying attention to what the other fast food restaurants are doing. They're just trying to build an amazing company. And let's be that. Like what, let, let's, let's think more like that rather than saying, okay, well, what, what's our EBITDA for, for this month? And how are we going to, how are we going to get another point out of that for next month? And well, okay. But, but is that really what's in line with what we're trying to accomplish? And how does that fit into our core values of putting people first and creating our future, embracing results, inspiring communities? Like let's be focused on what really drives life quality and is impactful for people, whether it's our customers, our employees, or the community. And I'm pretty sure that the financial side is going to take care of itself. Mm -hmm. So yes, our employees are excited. They they want to be part of growth, but they but nobody wants to lose the intimacy that that came with a small company, right? And so it's up to our branch managers to carry that on and say, hey, we're still focal point. Imagine John and seven guys back in, you know, 2003 or whatever, right? Like, let's hold on to that connectivity between each other and take a genuine interest in our people and know that we're playing for a bigger goal than just how profitable we can be and how much we can grow. And Robert, I'm just, I'm telling you, like, once you're committed to that mindset, Again, we we have more opportunities in front of us than we can hardly keep up with. When you're committed to that mindset, like the right, everything right becomes as attracted to you. You know, whether it's key people, key customers, potential companies to to partner up with, um, it it just creates alignment with the right people. And it's incredibly rewarding. And it's fun to watch our people benefit by it. No, that's awesome. And and I mean, I'm sure your confident level has dramatically increased by knowing what you've done and some of the challenges you've probably overcome with those the acquisitions. And I suppose it makes you just more confident going into those future partnerships or whatever those you know opportunities come up. Yeah, for sure. You know, I don't, I, I'd be shocked if there's a scenario that would just collapse into place that we would be doing three acquisitions in two months again, and which would be, you know, it would allow us to be much more diligent and intentional in helping the seller or, you know, the, the person that, that we owner that we partner up with, helping them through the process in a more intentional way, having gone through it now, right? Like, Again, if you just operate through life with like a servant's heart and you apply that to a potential seller too, who's poured their heart and soul into their business. Like I remember, I mean, I'm still an owner and founder, but I can remember those more challenging days so well that I can look at, at smaller operators with great empathy. And no matter, like when you drive around town, right, you see... You see guys working and every one of them I look at, I'm like, God bless you. Like, I, I, I just know what you're thinking about when you're having dinner tonight, right? Like, um, so anyway, the, the opportunity for us to really help uh, a business owner in that transition in a way that really honors what they built and, you know, helps get them some quality of life back while still giving them the pride of knowing that they built something like, and, and get rid of the headaches of like, Oh man, I got a freaking bit out insurance or, you know what I mean? Like that's not why they went away <laughs> no, no. with, with those headaches. Like 
if we can help with all the noise of the business ownership and say, hey, you focus on selling work and doing work in a way that delights the customer and honors your employees, like you just focus on those things and we'll deal with the noise. Like that's, I think that's a real opportunity. And the idea of improving the life quality of, of operators that have poured themselves into their business for years, like that's to me, that's got to be part of the equation. No, 100%. So what does the future look like uh, for Focal Point? And if you were to partner up with, you know, other companies, what would their, what would that look like in terms of size or the, the type of business? Yeah. You know, Robert, we're under no pressure to acquire. Like, we don't have a growth quota to me. You know, like, again, we just want to build a great company. So I think for us, you know, I'm, I'm a Midwest guy, Brett's a Midwest guy. And, you know, we do best with kind of like the idea of a handshake type approach to business. Right. And so I relate really well to Midwest type customers, you know, where, where if I tell you, we're going to do something like relationships matter to them and no one's trying to outsmart each other. No one's trying to, you know, you look for win-win arrangements. And so I think, you know, our footprint is to say, yeah, we we want to work within the Midwest, maybe, maybe down in the South a little bit. Um, and and I think we're looking for for business owners. You know, if if we look to expand beyond where we're at, which I, you know, I think there's some markets that that would appeal for sure. Um but more importantly, like I think smart numbers guys will say, oh my gosh, you know, we look at these EBITDA numbers and da, 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 da. And my brain just doesn't think like that. Of course, of course, that kind of has to be in the equation. But the bigger question for me is cultural alignment, hmm. right? Has the owner, you know, that's, that's what mattered to me in these three acquisitions is that does the owner go about their business and life and with honesty, you know, integrity, humility, do they have, do they ache for other people's success? Like if you have that wiring inside you, we can, we can almost do anything, right? Like, and so, you know, if, if you see business owners that are really wanting to build something amazing and they want to be part of something amazing and they just don't, they're John Muni in 2011 that needed Kevin Kehoe, right? That, that said, John, what are you doing? Like, you're incredible at these five things, but you're, you're not so good at these three (laughs) and can teach you those three or take them off your plate. Right. You know, and I'm not saying like our ideal, you know, partner would be bad at something. That's not what I'm trying to imply, but, but I think, you know, if their wiring's right in terms of how they view relationships and, you know, they've got a competitive motor about them, they, they want to win um, you know, and they want to be part of something that's, that's special. Like we can, we can install everything else. You know, we can, we can teach everything else. And, um, and it's really, I mean, there's just some really fun opportunities. Like we're already our clients here in St. Louis that have properties in Kansas city. I mean, I, I'm not sure what our sales growth is going to be in Kansas city, just based on the enthusiasm our customers have of the fact we're in Kansas city. I mean, I, That's awesome. That's it, awesome. it's, it's a pretty significant number. Yeah. Um, and I'm just like, Holy cow. Like, again, just, just, if you do nothing else, just serve people, just serve people in a way that makes you happy and them happy. And when you do that, like, you know, sales, it's, you, it, they come, right? Yeah, like sales are going to come if you take care of your people. Right. So, Anyway, so that, you know, what are we looking for? A, I don't know that we're looking, but B, if we were, um, you know, we're just looking for good, honest, humble business owners that like to win. I don't know how else to put it, right? That's good. I like that. I like that. So just trying to wrap up here, John, what, um, I mean, what what does the future look like? What uh, what would be some good parting words for those business owners who are maybe going home at night and 
they feel as though they're in a rut or in their comfort zone or they just don't know what to do. They're they're somewhat stuck. What would well, be the first steps for them to rethink? Yeah, I think you said it are. before. You know, whether in our case, you know, we're doing some acquisitions, right? But but most people aren't in that space. And I mean, I ran a company for 25 years before we were in that space, but the, the rules are still the same. And you said it before, surround yourself with good people and, and don't be afraid. You know, I, I heard it once said that you're the sum of the six people you spend the most time with. All right. I think there's some truth to that. Mm-hmm. Choose those people wisely. And there can be a tendency for us you know, we're considered to be in a blue collar industry and there can be a tendency for us to be intimidated by people that we think might be smarter than us. You know, I was not a good student in school. I can relate to that, you know, like, and, and I'm going to tell you like, no matter who you meet, they put their pants on one leg at a time, just like you and I, and most really successful people want to share and help other people be successful. So, you know, I would not, I would really encourage your listeners at all levels to look to surround themselves with people that make them better, whether personally or professionally, that take a genuine interest. I'll I'll tell you a quick, real quick story about one of one of our advisory board members. Back in 2005, again, before I knew how to run a business, Labor Day weekend, I'm out of money. Super strong. I mean, literally eating Pepto-Bismol tablets for breakfast because my stomach was so upset. And, you know, and that the, the, the weeks prior to Labor Day. And I knew going out on two sales calls that Saturday morning that I had to sell the second sales call of putting a backyard water feature in for a longtime customer, still a customer, Started with us in 1998. He's still a customer, <laughs> and I and I knew I had to sell it for eleven thousand dollars. I I knew if I didn't get half down, I wouldn't make payroll on Wednesday. All right, make the sales pitch. He says, "I love it." Do you need any money down? I said, "Half down would be great, Mister Slocum." And he wrote me a check for fifty five hundred dollars. I made payroll on Wednesday by less than a hundred dollars. Wow. All right. So I wasn't out of the woods yet though, right? I knew I was in trouble. I go out to lunch with uh, one of my customers that became a friend and, and you know, he, he was very successful um, and did private investments and stuff. And I told him my situation. I said, you know, the bank won't loan me more money and I don't know of a bank that will. And I'm just not sure what, how this is gonna play out. He said, well, I'm an investor at a local bank and go talk to this guy. He's the president of the bank. They're hyper aggressive on loans right now. And my guess is that he'll make you a loan. Like, holy cow. Okay, great. So I have my stuff put together, you know, my balance sheet, my PL, and I go visit with the president of the bank. And he looks over and he says, Come back tomorrow. Okay. So I come back tomorrow. He said, John, we'll make you a loan. All right, sounds good. And uh, that's how we're going to break it up, 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 boom, and all this stuff. Well, I come to find out later that the customer slash friend that I met with that was an investor in the bank called the president of the bank and said, I'll put money up for collateral. Oh, wow. And oh. I got the loan because of that. Wow. Right? So, A, like you're never out of the fight. Like sometimes you have to find the crack in the wall that will help you break through when it's not evident, when the entire universe has accepted the fact, has has accepted what the facts are. You sometimes have to believe they're not the case. And, um, And when you surround yourself with that caliber of person, opportunities come, right? And, you know, that loan allowed us to get through. We had a good winter, you know, it snowed that winter and stabilized us. And, and, you know, we just, we got through and then, you know, enter Kevin in 2011, he said, get rid of the solar system. 
<laughs> that your kids through. <laughs> Get your art chart right. You know, manage your money like this. You know, blah blah blah. Um, but yeah, I mean, whether you're looking to acquire or you're just you're looking to go from you know, my first year in business, we did forty five thousand dollars in nineteen ninety eight. Nineteen ninety nine, we did ninety thousand dollars. You know, I mean, like I know every step all the way through, and no matter what step you're at align yourself with people that are that are going to make you better and that have the emotional capacity to care about you on a personal level and when you find those people you know it's just and and of course you know you can never fail to disappoint them you've got to always you know i was worthy of of chris's trust chris jagels the the advisory board member that that did that for me Right. And I had proven who I was as a, as a person to him prior to that moment. Right. Otherwise he wouldn't have done it. And, um, that's integrity, right? He saw integrity. So if you want those breaks, you know, some people call it luck for sure, but, but you've got to be operating your life in such a way that you're worthy of the break. You're worthy of the luck. And if you're not willing to, to live that discipline, you know, hard approach, uh, don't expect luck because people won't buy into you. Yeah, I agree. John, that's uh, amazing parting words. No, thanks. Thank you for, I don't, you for hey, sharing. I don't take compliments at all, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just keep throwing it at you because, you know, you deserve <laughs> them. But I mean, stories like that just really emphasize – the, the points you're making and uh, that's so true I've, you know it's happened to me several times and i've been there in terms of scraping together money for cash flow and you know unless you've been in that place oh. then you don't appreciate you know some of the well uh, robert here's what's cool that what's cool is those really really difficult moments when when you get through them and and people help you get through them it the spirit of gratitude you have as you live life from that point forward is never ending. You know, like when you can remember those difficult times so well and how people expecting nothing in return helped you through it. It is, it is difficult to tell you like how much gratitude and happiness I have by by taking that spirit on for other people right like it it's it just yeah i mean it changed my life not only did it get me through that difficult stretch but it recalibrated my definition of success it's not about what you gain out of a situation it's about what you're able to contribute and once you understand that that's really what success looks like it completely changes your heart and how you go about living it so and then one one or plug I'd like to make for you. And I, I mean this with great sincerity, my business acumen didn't only get better because of Kevin, but the peer groups, anybody that is on the fence of getting involved in peer groups needs to do it. We became such a better business when we joined the peer groups. And, you know, to be able to sit with other business owners who have experienced a lot of what you've experienced and have them provide what they, you know, input on what they did to get through that or how they built a great company, you know, it's, it is such a valuable resource that we have in the industry by utilizing peer groups. Um, If not for the peer groups, I would not be in the position we're in for this growth opportunity. I mean, not only getting to 25 million in 2022, but certainly for having the strength of an organization to, you know, make these acquisitions. So, you know, anybody that's on the fence of whether or not as a landscape contractor that they should do it. And and a lot of times you say, well, I can't afford it. And I don't remember Robert, how big I was, maybe we were 5 million, 7 million. 
And I mean, but not, I mean, we weren't crazy profitable. We were, we were okay profitable, but you know, when we joined the peer groups, you just to be able to benchmark against their performance and, Oh my gosh, we're spending way too much in this area. And right, how did you right. handle this? And what about your website design? All that stuff. I mean, my gosh, it's such a cheap way to get incredibly good advice. So um, anyway, there's that, that's, yeah, well, thank you, John. I'm, I'm incapable of saying I don't uh, of saying something I don't mean. And even though you know you're on the line here, it's I mean every word of it. Um, it's such a valuable tool for us, and we're still in it. I mean, yeah. you know, here we're I don't know. Next year we're projecting to be over 50 million, nice. and Brett and I still get Brett and I still get tremendous value out of the peer groups, and those owners challenge us every time we meet. So it's it's great. That's awesome. I well, appreciate the support, John. I feel the same way. When I was part of a peer group, it was game changing for for my old business. So, uh, John, um, as always, I, I really do appreciate not only your time but all your wisdom that you've shared. I, I hope you continued success, you. and uh, I look forward to seeing you at uh, some future events. Yeah, thanks, Robert. Appreciate it. Appreciate all the support. You guys have a tremendous organization, and. You're wired, same, same, you know, humility. You just, you guys have a natural desire to serve and it, it shows. So it's greatly, greatly appreciated on behalf of all the other business owners that you guys work with. Hopefully that was pure dead brilliant to you and you got some great takeaways for your business or your leadership role. This is Robert Clinkybeard and I'd love to get you and your friends to join us in a future journey. So please subscribe to the various podcast channels or visit the commerciallandscaper.com or wilson360.com. Big thank you again to our partner Weathermatic and I really encourage you to reach out to them and see about irrigation solutions or partnership with them. Hopefully you have a pure dead brilliant day. Cheers everyone.